I want to talk to you about a topic that I think um, is probably more important than most of us have paused lately to realize. And how many of you are familiar with the term the judgment seat of Christ? Anybody? Okay, about quarter of the room. Now, when we, when we hear the judgment seat, we're like, let's just go, man. This is gonna, he's going to beat us. To, it's not that judgment. If you're saved, you never have to worry about standing before God and being judged by your sin. It's already taken care of. So Jesus stood in your place for that judgment. He actually hung in your place for that judgment. All of your sin, if you're born again, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, if you're saved, if you're redeemed, if you're a child of God, however term you want to put on it, um, your sin was completely and fully judged through the blood of Jesus Christ, and it has been atoned for. So you will never stand before the Father and give an account for your sin. You will, however, give an accounting for what you did with your life after you were born again. Jesus is a very generous king. He actually loves to reward the faithfulness of those who belong to him. And so this place, this event called the judgment seat of Christ is an event, it is an occasion, it's an appointment that every single child of God is going to experience. You will not be there with your spouse. You won't be able to be there with your mom or your dad or your pastor or your favorite Christian. You're, you're not going to be able to be there with, you know, a bunch of people that did you wrong in life so you can say, these are the reasons why my life never really counted for you. It's just going to be you and the king. And his goal there is to reward you eternally for everything you ever intentionally did for his glory and with your motivations being that I want to make it all about you. And so this is an incredible event because these rewards, and I'm going to get to a couple of different passages here in a moment. The rewards at the judgment seat of Christ are eternal rewards. Now, we don't understand exactly what they're going to be. They're termed in scripture as crowns. You've heard that, right? We lay our crowns down. But these crowns are actually, in the Greek language, wreaths. In the, in the Isthmian Games, or more probably after that, the Olympic Games, the winners of the events would stand before the tribunal and they would receive a wreath if they won their contest. And that wreath was known as a crown, a stephanos. And that would be something they would wear on their head. And that's the picture that is used in scripture for us receiving rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. Now, it's not going to be that you're going to be walking around with 642 wreaths on your glorified head for all of eternity. What these wreaths are going to represent is the capacity in which you function in the everlasting kingdom. Now, I want to give you something right off the bat. Salvation is free. You can't work for it. You can't buy it. You can't earn it. The only way you will ever be saved is by trusting in what Jesus did for you by dying for your sins, rising again the third day, and there has to be a moment in this lifetime where you bow before him and you say, I repent of my sin. I know I'm lost. I know I can't save myself, but I believe that you died to pay for my sin. I believe you rose again the third day, triumphing over my judgment and my sin. So Jesus, I surrender to you. I bow before you. I trust you as my Lord and Savior. That's about the shortest form of the gospel I can present to you tonight. If you have done that, the Bible says you're redeemed. The Bible says you're forgiven. The Bible says you have been born again. You have literally received the Lord Jesus by faith and the Holy Spirit, when you do that, takes up residence in your heart. You can never earn it. It's already paid for. As a matter of fact, if you try to earn it, you actually commit sin. Because to try to earn what cost him his life, to try to earn it by our paltry religious works would be an insult to the, to the king. So he paid for it. It's all paid for, but rewards, they're not free. They're all earned. Every single reward that is given out in eternity will be given according to what we did in this life. 
And the Bible speaks a lot about this. Jesus talked a lot about rewards. Some people be like, I don't really want to be motivated by rewards. That's not important to me. Well, you need to repent because it was important to Jesus. Jesus wanted us to know about rewards. Jesus actually motivated us in his sermons by rewards many times. So it's not some incidental thing. It's something that we need to know more about. So tonight I want to talk to you about the King's Review. Your life and my life are going to be reviewed by the Lord. And he's going to be able with perfect discernment, focus in on our lives that we lived on earth. We'll be in heaven with him. He'll focus in on our lives and he will be able to instantaneously instantaneously reveal to you the entire value of your earthly life. And so when we think about this and when we read these scriptures, this is what I do. You can do whatever you want to do, but I'll tell you what I do. When I read these verses, I think to myself, what am I doing in my life that really matters? What am I doing? It doesn't, you don't have to be in ministry. You don't have to be on a platform. You don't have to work at a church or go overseas. No, everything we do in this life, whether it's changing diapers, washing dishes, or being the CEO of a company, everything we do in this life, here's the beauty of it, can be done as unto the Lord with the right heart motivation with the right intentionality, with the right understanding that everything we do, we do under the glory of God. Everything we do in life can receive an eternal reward. And God wants us to be motivated by that. So let me start tonight in 1 Corinthians chapter number three. I think we'll be in three places if we have enough time, at least two places. But 1 Corinthians chapter number three, verse number nine, this is what Paul writes. We are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. Now, here you go. Here it starts getting instructional. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest for the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss. Though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. So that's the first passage I want to read to you tonight when we're talking about this issue of rewards. Paul is writing the church at Corinth. And if you're not familiar with that church of Corinth, the Corinthian church, it's a jacked up church. They had tongues, they had prophecy, they had miracles, they had healings, and they had a whole lot of spiritual immaturity. They fought with each other. They said, we follow this leader. Well, we follow this leader. Oh, we don't follow any leader. We're just super spiritual. We only follow Jesus by faith. And so there was a whole lot of immaturity and carnality. And the book of 1 Corinthians was really Paul writing them to straighten them out on some things that they were doing poorly. And one of those things was they were trying to say... Well, we we're loyal to Paul and others are saying, well, we're loyal to Peter and others are saying, well, no, not us. We're loyal to Apollos. And so Paul opens up first Corinthians one, two, and three, and he's telling them, Hey guys, Peter ain't anything. I'm not anything. And Apollos ain't anything. We are simply servants of the most high God. You don't need to worship us. You need to worship the Lord Jesus Christ and recognize that all we're doing in the church is operating with the grace to serve that God has given us. You, by the way, just real quickly, it's not my message tonight. We need to get that in us. That we don't worship those that lead us. We don't worship those. And I know nobody bows down. But some people will will look to a man or a woman that is a a spiritual influence on their life. And they'll raise them up a little higher than they need to be raised up. And the problem with that is, is when that person who they've exalted in their minds turns out to be human. Turns out to, you know, not walk on water. 
they actually still have to be sanctified and sometimes they don't act that way. That person, that, that person falls in their view. And so Paul is very careful to say, hey, make sure you, you look at your leaders with the proper perspective. And then Paul starts talking to them very clearly and he's saying, my job in your life was to lay an apostolic foundation. And somebody is building upon the foundation that I laid. And that's where he starts saying, and every single one of us need to take care how we build upon the foundation of Jesus Christ. So let's walk through this, okay? This first passage, this applies to you, this applies to me. We're going to be evaluated and rewarded for our investments as Christians. We're going to be evaluated by Jesus Christ who brought us into the kingdom. And according to what he assesses about our lives, we will be rewarded. And so it's this expectation on our life that we would actually invest. Let me read these verses at the beginning again. He says, we're God's fellow workers. Just stop right there. God says, will you work with me to build my kingdom? Will you over here and you over here and you back there and this one right here, will you guys work together with each other and work together with me and let's build and advance the kingdom? And that's what Christians have been doing for 2,000 years. Then Paul says this, you are God's field. Earlier he had talked about one, one plants and one waters and God gives the increase. He had used this harvest metaphor and he's about to flip. He's about to move from a, um, an agricultural metaphor to an architectural metaphor. He's now talking about you're God's field, but you're also God's building. And that's where this illustration comes into play. He says, according to the grace of God giving to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid the foundation and somebody else is building upon it. They'll just leave that verse up there for a minute. And just, I want you to know what he's saying. Paul said, God gave me the grace to be an apostle. You only get to be who you are in the kingdom according to the grace that God has given you. One of the things the Lord delights in is when you, as one of his children, find out who you are in the kingdom. Now, we know all the glory goes to God, but one of the treasures of the kingdom is that moment in your life where you find out, this is what I'm supposed to do. I'm a son, I'm a daughter, but when it comes to the work of the Lord, this is what he wants me to do. And yes, it can change from season to season, but generally you come to terms with who you are, what gifts you have, what gifts you don't have, what opportunities you have. There's never to be competition. Why? Because we're supposed to hear from the Lord, what do I do to help build the kingdom as your co-laborer, as your fellow worker? And so Paul says, my grace was apostolic. I came into Corinth and none of y'all knew Jesus. Y'all were a bunch of pagans. Y'all were a bunch of heathens. You bowed down to false idols. You committed all sorts of fornication, both heterosexual and homosexual. You lived like the devil. And Paul says, but I came in, I brought you the gospel of Jesus. The light went off. You repented. You got saved. And we began a foundational work together. That was Paul's grace. And then he says this, after the foundation is laid, let each one take care how he builds upon it. There's the expectation right there, friends. The expectation is that you would take care. You would take time. You would be intentional. You would think it through. You would actually structure your life on some level to make sure that what you're building with your life leads to God's glory and leads to your purpose, connects to your purpose in the kingdom, but it means that we have to take care. Nobody ever accidentally becomes fruitful in the kingdom. Um, you might hit a, you know, an initial rush when you get saved and good things happen for a minute, but if you're going to run this marathon, not a sprint, a long race, it means you got to get intentional about how you live. And so Paul goes on to say in verse 11, There's no other foundation other than Jesus Christ. And then verse 12 is the one I'm trying to get to. He says, now, if anybody builds upon the foundation, the foundation is your salvation. It is your relationship with God through Jesus Christ. It's paid for by him. And the Lord says, I laid the foundation. It cost me everything. I give it to you. I thought that you were worthy enough to receive this. I love you enough and I'm giving it to you. I want you to build on it. And so that's our calling. Our calling is to do something with what we've received. And then he gives these illustrations. Some people are going to build with these materials. We got any contractors or subcontractors in the room? Anybody that does building? Okay, most of you are familiar with the process, okay? You're going to use materials to build the building. 
And in ancient times, the best materials were actually oftentimes precious metals and jewels. Gold, silver, precious stones. Those are worthy investments of our lives as Christians. The other side of the aisle is wood, hay, and straw. Now, let me just test you because some of y'all are looking a little sleepy right now. Let me just test you. When fire hits gold and silver and precious stones, those things become what? More purified, especially the gold and the silver. Fire purifies precious metals. When fire hits wood, hay, and straw, tell me, Einstein, what happens? It burns up. It burns up. And Paul's saying this. He's saying, we're going to be tried by fire. We're going to be tested by the pure, fiery, and not in a destructive way, but the discernment or the judgment of Jesus. Remember when he's described in the book of Revelation as having eyes like fire? That always speaks of discernment or judgment. In this case, it's discernment. He's going to look at what we built our life with, and with eyes of fire, he's going to assess what our lives are. And if it's wood and straw and things that are flammable, they'll burn up. But if we've built with with intentionality, valuing the foundation that's been laid, we're going to build, and it's described as, as silver and gold and precious stones, and those things gain purity when they're tested. So what does all this mean? It means the materials that we build with symbolize the value that we assign to our salvation. Do we assign a superior value to the fact that we're saved by grace? Do we assign an inferior value? Those are the two things that he's illustrating here. So in verse number 13, this is what he says. Each one's work will become manifest for the day. And they capitalize the word day. For the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. Okay, so now he's, he's describing something that he got by revelation from the Lord. Somewhere, Paul had multiple encounters with the Lord. One, at least one, was a third heaven encounter where he saw things and was told things that he couldn't even speak. He couldn't even reveal it all. And then there were other times where he had face-to-face encounters with the resurrected Jesus. Right after he was saved, he spent some time in the deserts of Arabia where most scholars believe that he got mentored, if you can call it that way. He got taught by God himself, Holy Spirit, or the resurrected Son of God. So Paul all comes away with these revelations that he's now talking to us about in ways that can help us. And this is what he's telling you. Each one's work, that means you. That means me. My life, the work, what I built upon my salvation with my life will become manifest. What does that mean? He's going to disclose it. He's going to reveal it to me. This is not about you standing in front of a billion, two billion, three billion redeemed people and putting all your life up on the big screen. That's not what it's about. It's, we don't know the logistics of how it works, but it'll be a one-on-one kind of environment with you and the Lord. And instantaneously at this assessment, the King's review, your life and its value will be revealed to you. He already knows what it is. But it'll be revealed to you and to me. Why? Because the day will disclose it. And that lets you know it is an appointment on God's calendar. There's an appointed day where Jeff Lyle is going to stand before Jesus Christ. Even as I say that, I'm like, oh God. No, I'm not kidding. I'm saved. I'm not worried about where I'm going. But there is this sense of how much of my life could ever be enough for him. So it, it doesn't defeat me. It just motivates me. I'm like, how can I get lazy on him? How can I give in to bitterness and quit on him because somebody else made me mad? How can I get cooperate with all the distractions and all the temptations and all the, the assaults of the enemy and, and get my eyes off of the king when he never takes his eyes off of me? So those are the kind of things that make this thing come to life. And there's coming a day where, like, he's not going to be mad. Have you ever had a job review that made you want to go change your pants? I mean, it's just like one of those things where you're like, oh, I don't know if I've been good. I don't know if I've done enough. It's not going to be like that. This, the one reviewing you is the one who loved you so much that he died for you. But there will be an intensity on it. Because you're about to find out, what was my four score and ten years on earth worth? Because I could make millions of dollars. I could get 
150,000 followers on social media. I could get my name out there. I could build a lot of stuff. I could, I, I mean, theoretically, I could be beautiful, tall, dark, and handsome. And I could be, I could be all the things. I could have the, the car and the house and the perfect family. And I, I could have a ministry that everybody thought he was great. But when the end of the show is over, I'm going to stand before him. And he's going to say, Jeff. Here's what your life was about. And will it have an echo that lasts for eternity? Well, that day is going to reveal it. Again, verse 13, it'll be revealed by fire. And this fire, this discerning assessment from the Lord will test what sort of work each one has done. You know what that tells me? Everybody is built. Every Christian is building something with his or her life. And the question is not, are we building? The question is, what value have we assigned to the foundation, our salvation? And from that, are we building something that's going to pass the discerning test of the king's review? Verse 14 and 15. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, survives what? That holy fire. If it survives, he will receive a reward. Can we just pause there for a minute? This is the word of God. This is the Bible saying, if you intentionally live your life for the glory of Jesus, you will be rewarded by Jesus. I mean, that, 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 what else could motivate us more? That if I live, it may not be impressive, it may not be noticed, it may not, you know, make a, you know, it's not going to make the front page of an internet website that Jeff Lyle has done something, but that's not the audience we're looking for. If I intentionally live out my days conscious of the fact that I'm not my own, I'm bought with a price, my life doesn't really belong to me, I'm stewarding the life that was given to me for the glory of another, and in doing so, by the way, just to let you know, newsflash, in doing that, in living for Jesus, I'm actually really happy. It's actually really satisfying. It's not like the spirit-filled Christian who's living for Jesus says, "Eh, another day living for the Son of God. You know, it's not like you get robbed, man. It's like you, you start finding out, oh, this is who I am. This is what I'm meant for. This is good. Because you're not doing life alone. Like he becomes more real to you the longer that you do it. And then of all things, when we step into his presence, I mean, he paid for everything to get us there. And then we step into his presence and he says, well done. You did good, daughter. You did good, son. You served me well. Here is your reward. Like, friends, I just want to speak this over you. That can happen for you. And it happens to those who make up their mind that they're going to live for the next world, even if it means not enjoying everything in this world. There's just some things that other people can do that aren't sin. I'm not talking about sin. I'm just talking about Paul saying all things are lawful, but not all things are profitable. So there's some things that I would have to say, you know, that's available to me. It's not a sin. But if I go after that, it's going to pull me away from this. And I'm really wanting to live for this because this is who I am in the kingdom. And then you got all everybody else and maybe they're living for these other things that again aren't sinful, but that's just not God's call on your life. So when you deny yourself, that's part of denying yourself. Jesus said, if anybody would be my disciple, he's got to take up his cross, deny himself daily and follow after me. Part of your denying yourself is not just discerning what is evil and what is good, but it's what is the difference between what is good and what is best. And so as we choose what is best, we step into the presence of the Lord and he says, here is a reward. But verse 15 gives you the other side of the coin. If anyone's work is burned up, he'll suffer loss. Though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Now, hear the word of the Lord. This occasion is not about whether you get in or not. The only way we're getting in, I know I've been clear about this, but it just sometimes we, we, we have it, then we lose it, we have it, we lose it. The only way you're getting into paradise, into God's kingdom, is because of what Jesus did for you, not what you did for him. 
And so because you have humbled yourself and said, I can't add to it, I can't complete it, I don't need to meet him halfway, I just need to bow, repent, trust, and believe, Jesus says, I justify you. You're justified by faith. And so when we, when we, when we receive that, but then we proceed to leave, live our life flippantly. We give our time, we give our resources, we give our calendars and our clocks and our, our wallets and our time. When we, when we give those things, those, those things to other stuff, inferior stuff, that's what he's talking about, the wood, the hay, the straw. Because you can't build something lasting on straw. You can't build something that will survive the fire of God's holy discernment and evaluation. You can't build that out of wood and hay. Those are wasted investments. Listen to me. I don't want to be Debbie Downer, but also don't, I, don't want to, I don't want to cover truth that can help you. Your life may matter amazingly down here, and you may have great senses of accomplishment. But it's possible that a life down here that impresses everybody around us won't hold a single shred of value in eternity. And that's a tragedy. Because that doesn't have to happen to any believer. So Paul is telling us, you can receive a reward or you can lose the reward that you would have received. And he says this, he says, now listen, it's not like you get rejected and you're booted out of heaven because your life didn't count. It's just that you live with some form of awareness that what could have been will never be because you chose on earth to live for the present moment instead of for eternity. And guys, I, if I can risk this somewhat critical sounding comment, I think that's most Christians. I think because in the last hundred years in America, we have been so hyper evangelistic that it's about getting everybody to believe on Jesus, repent of their sin, ask Jesus into their heart. And so every church service, at least coming from the world I came from, I came from a very evangelistic denomination, and I thank God for that. The Baptists have won more people to the Lord probably than any other denomination. Thank the Lord for them. But the way it was often presented was, there you go, you just finished everything. You got saved, and that's great. And there wasn't as much said about from that point, because it's almost like that was the finish line. Okay, John Boy got saved. Okay, Sally got saved. Praise God, that's awesome. And Sally and John Boy aren't discipled. And they're not told about how to build on that foundation. And they're not trained and they're not, they're not coached. They're not mentored. And so they live for years thinking, well, I did everything I was supposed to do. I'm going to go to heaven when I die. Until then, I got to figure out what I'm going to live for. And we just haven't done as good of a job at, at, at kind of keeping in front of people like, hey, it's actually not the finish line when you get, get saved. It's the starting line. And after that is where Christianity really takes on its shape in our lives. So before we move to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, just remember this. I think I've said it enough. I'm just going to say it one more time. What we do for God's glory with our lives and why we do it, and what the level of sacrifice is, that determines your reward. What do you do for God's glory? Why do you do it? And then what does it cost you? Those are criteria for rewards at the end of the age. Because you could actually do the right thing, but you could do it because it brings you praise and, and glory. People think awesome about you. God says, up, oh, that's wood, hay, stubble. Like, Lord, I obeyed, I did the right thing. God says, yeah, I love you and everything, but you and I both know you did it because you liked the fact that people were watching you and thought great of you. And you're like, you mean I gotta do the right thing with the right motivation? He says, absolutely, that's why I told you you have to carry a cross. Because you gotta slay that pride. You gotta, cru is this too much for y'all tonight? <laughs> like, like this is, this is discipling us. Like I'm, I'm getting challenged by it. Why do we do what we do for the Lord? Do you do it because of religious guilt? That's bad. 
Like I, I, I tell people all the time, there are people who say, well, I'm not really feeling it and I don't want to go through the motions. And this is what I like to tell them. I was like, don't stay in that rut of going through the motions, but don't stop doing the right thing just because you don't feel like you're doing it for the right reason. Keep doing the right thing and ask God to purify your reasons as you do the right thing. And then your right motivation connects with the right activity and reward happens, yes, in the present, but it also stores up treasure for you in heaven. But don't miss this part, guys, the level of sacrifice. This is properly illustrated when Jesus looked at the broke widow. Remember, there were some that were, had money, they had nice clothes and everything, and the offerings were given, and they would, you know, kind of wave their $20 bill in the air and throw it in the plate, and, you know, rah, bah, 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 you know, they just draw attention to themselves. They, Jesus said, you're sounding a trumpet before you do your giving. And then there was this one little old lady who nobody saw except Jesus. And she gave her last coin, put it in there, and Jesus just stopped everybody and says, y'all see her? Great is her reward because she gave everything she had. So the level of sacrifice. Somebody puts $20 in the plate, like when we used to pass the plates. There are some people that put $20 in there and it's a massive sacrifice. It took faith for them to release that $20. There's other people being there who say, oh, yeah, man, just throw it in there, never give it another thought because they got 5000 in their wallet. One sacrificed, one didn't. Each gave the same amount, but there's a different reward. You follow me? So King David, as we studied a few weeks ago, King David said this, I will not offer anything to the Lord from that which costs me nothing. And that is a principle. If you will get that in your spirit, it will transform your life. You will say, I'm not looking for the guilty conscience to be eased by doing some religious work so I can raise my hand and said, I served God once a month. No, friends, it's how can I do what I do? You know, right now there are people watching babies. It's a sacrifice of their time. There are people that are subbing in down at the youth house that are down there every week and their names never get in the bulletin. It's a sacrifice of time. There were people in our Saturday picnic up here. We're here at seven o'clock in the morning and some that were here when the sun was close to going down, serving behind the scenes, sacrificing. Now that shouldn't make me feel guilty or you feel guilty, but it should motivate me to assess what does my Christianity cost me on a practical level? And yes, salvation is free. But rewards aren't. And by the way, glory for Christ will cost you something in your life. So we'll go a little bit further. I'm just going to keep going by faith because I can't tell if you're tired or angry. But either way, I'm going to obey tonight, okay? All right, so 2 Corinthians 5, 9, and 10. I'm, I'm, I'll just, I'm going to use two verses and two points. This talks about our motivation, okay? Just get this. Lord, help us with this. In verse number nine of 2 Corinthians 5, it says, so whether we are at home or away, Paul was talking about being at home with the Lord in heaven or down here, away, still on earth, whether we're there or we're here, we're going to make it our aim to please him. Guys, it's not that complicated. Making a headline decision. I want to please the Lord. I just want to please the Lord. Now, it isn't about micro dissecting. Is this please God or is this please God or is this please God? Like he's going to give you discernment. It's not supposed to frustrate you. Um, in, In a healthy marriage, each spouse is saying there are moments where he or she doesn't want to do what needs to be done, but they do it for the benefit of the other. Like, I'm just going to tell you, I don't love, we got a long driveway now. I don't love lugging those big stinking trash cans down the driveway on a gravel driveway. They're bumping. They're filled with somebody else's garbage. I don't make that much garbage. Or do I, Michelle? You, you would know. You would know my office. But, but at home, it's like, that's my boy. My boy is the garbage making machine. But I'm thinking to myself, I don't want my wife going down the driveway with those big old things. I don't want her being out there at night and, you know, in the middle of nowhere, dragging those things up the driveway. Now, that's a very small thing. And by the way, that does not make me heroic. It just makes me a husband that wants a happy wife. She does way more for me when it comes to the domestic stuff. And listen, she doesn't walk around saying, oh, Jeff's socks. I get to wash his socks again. Oh, we get 
get to clean up the underwear again and we get to scrub the shower again. Oh, and the dishes. I can't wait to wash my husband. We don't live in a fantasy land fairy tale. They're just dutiful things that we do. And we do them because we esteem others better than ourselves. That's what the scriptures teach us to do. And so guys, when it comes to pleasing the Lord, we have to develop. You have to retrain your instincts. You were born with a savagely selfish instinct. Come on. Some of y'all are not convinced. How many of you had to train your two-year-old to be obnoxious? They just knew how to do it. Why? Because it's that nature. And if that nature doesn't come under the blood and get compensated for by the presence of the Holy Spirit, you won't be two years old and be obnoxious. You'll be 52 years old and be obnoxious. And so we get our instincts retrained by the Holy Spirit to where it's not about me anymore. And I'm going to tell you something. If I have the right attitude when I'm taking the garbage cans down... I just believe God's that good. I believe there'll be a reward for it. If I do it consistently, I'm not grumbling. I'm not slamming them around like somebody else should have done that. I know none of y'all have ever slammed doors or drawers in your house. But for the sake of the carnal people watching, um, we'll just put that out there. Like, guys, retrain your instincts and recognize you can clean the house for the glory of God. You, You can let the person in line go ahead of you for the glory of God at the grocery store. You can be kind when somebody smarts off to you for the glory of God. And I'm just telling you, the Lord's not up there saying, I don't really want to give too many rewards. He's generous beyond measure. And he has the ability to omnisciently assess your entire life and reward you for anything that you did because you knew it would honor him. So we've just got to, we've got to expand our thinking. A lot of people think, well, I don't sing, I don't preach, and I don't have a church ministry. Do you know how little time we're actually in the church together, the building? If this is all of the kingdom that there is, man, ain't very many people get any rewards because there's limited opportunities at the church house. It's about your life, not your Sunday. So the happy component is this. We can make it our aim to please him. Like that motivates me. It's not about trying to avoid those things that displease him. It's like living proactively. Like like I can do something today that makes the Lord smile. Now there is the heavy component of it too. The heavy component is this. This is sometimes why we should be motivated. Because 2 Corinthians 5.10 says we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Everybody's going to go. Keep that in mind, okay? Like don't let that drizzle out of your, your spiritual hearing. We've got to all stand before them, uh, before him one day. Why? So that we may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. By the way, there's a lot of people that get confused about the judgment seat of Christ because of that verse. It's like, Jeff, it's right there. We're going to receive something for our evil doings. No, it's still in the context of receiving rewards. And that Greek word there that is translated in the English evil is a Greek word that indicates worthless. So you go back to the other passage. The precious stones and the jewels, worthwhile. The wood, the hay, the straw, worthless. And so Paul is here saying, again, it's the same author that wrote 2 Corinthians, that wrote 1 Corinthians. He's not changing his theology. He's saying, you're going to receive something for what you did. If it's good, there's going to be a reward. But if it's bad, like I told you in the last letter, it's all going to go up in smoke. So that's a reality that none of us want to deal with. So again, during this time, this is called the church age that we're living in, our performance. Yes, your performance how you're living will determine your position in the kingdom age. So right now, you're literally interviewing for your kingdom assignment. You're an intern. I'm an intern. Like, this is not all that there is. What's coming is vastly, it's not even worthy to be compared, vastly more important than what's happening now. And as I'm living my life in this trial run down here that has great importance, but it's not the ultimate end. You're literally candidating for the opportunities you're going to have in the coming kingdom. All right, last one, and I think I've got enough time to do it. We're going to go to Romans chapter 14, and this is going to help you get free. Some of you need to get free right here, because you know what's happening right now. I guarantee you, in a crowd even as small as this one is right now, there are some people saying, 
Yeah, man, that girl over there, she needs to get her act together. She needs to be serving the Lord. She, needs, she ain't going to have nothing. I can smell the smoke already. It's all going to get burned up. And that guy over there, I tell you, I've been lapping him. I've been running circles around that dude. I am feeling awesome about myself. The Lord's going to say, uh, that's an illegal move in the kingdom. And this, this will so free you up. I want to just preach Romans 14 and 15 for a few weeks here in the not too distant future. Because Romans 14 and 15 are what delivered me from a legalistic mindset many, many years ago. Going back 20 years plus now ago. That Romans 14 and 15. Because I, I fell into the habit that a lot of zealous young men do when they get saved. They're comparing. They're assessing. They're like, because young men are typically competitive and that doesn't get burned off of you when you come into the kingdom. And so it's like, man, I'm going to out-Christian you. I'm going to out-serve you. I'm going to out-give you. I'm going to out-sacrifice you. And then you get this little, I didn't realize it at the time. I'm just sitting there thinking, oh, I'm serving God. And God's trying to tell me, you are doing the right thing, but your motivations are horrible. I guarantee you probably most of what I did for the first five years I was a Christian, wood, hay, and straw. Guarantee you. I'm saved, hallelujah, but I'm going to look back on that and I'm like, I was doing the right thing, but my motives were terrible. So, let's get some help about our individual accountability for our own investments. Romans 14.10. Here we go. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. Now just stop right there. You know, we're not supposed to go around judging each other, right? We're not supposed to be cracking down on each other, talking about what's wrong with each other. When somebody stumbles and falls, we don't take delight in it. There's some scandalous stuff that broke this week about a national Christian leader who I actually know and some terrible things apparently happened in his his past. And it's just all over the internet and like... People that say they belong to Jesus or seem to be gleefully delighting in this man's fall. And I'm thinking to myself, how can that be the Lord? But it's obvious when it's a big name in the culture, it's not as obvious as when somebody you don't like maybe gets exposed for something. Or maybe the Lord tweaks something and shines the spotlight on them. And maybe others are seeing what they're all about when you smugly said, yeah, I knew it all along. This is what the antidote for that is. The antidote is this. You're going to stand before Jesus Christ and give an account for you. So we infer you don't have enough time to be inspecting other people's fruit. You are not the fruit inspector. You you don't, listen, if you're going to use energy to assess and evaluate, look in the mirror, sister. Look right back at that face looking at you, brother. That's the one you want to make sure is walking with the Lord. Now, I'm not making this up because, again, Paul asks, why are you passing judgment on other people? Why do you look down? That's that word despise. Why do you look down on other Christians? Don't you know, he says, You're going to stand individually before the Lord. When that hit me back in the late 90s, I mean, it was like a wake-up call. I didn't feel bullied by the Holy Spirit on it, but I felt like the Lord just kind of grabbed me by the back of the head and said, come here for a second, and got right in my face and said, you don't want to waste your life diagnosing and judging and comparing yourself to other people. Now go and be free. And I promise you, I repented. And as best as I know my heart... Ever since that season in my life, I have been on a, an, a, a trajectory that has gotten me more and more free from judging other people or comparing myself to other people. And I like it. You, you that are always comparing yourself and ju- y'all are sad. I guarantee you, I'm going to prophesy, you're sad. Because you're, you, you always have to find somebody being less than in order for you to feel like you're acceptable. And it's exhausting. And so Paul reminds us, of the actual criteria for judging in verse number 11. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. The Lord says, you don't need to judge one of my other servants. They're mine. Now, it doesn't mean we don't deal with sin. There are other scriptures that apply to that. It doesn't mean we're completely unaccountable. But what it means is there is this propensity in a lot of Christians to live a life where they're fixated on other people. 
they're critical of other people. It doesn't have to just be in the church. It can be in your home. Like guys, I want to tell you something like we, we, if I could turn back the clock, I would change some of the ways I parented my two kids. Now, both of my children love the Lord, but I look back and I realized I, I often got the right result out of them, but I didn't do it in a way that endeared them to God. Husbands and wives do it to each other. Those critical words, nagging, 11th commandment. It's not in the Bible, but 11th commandment, thou shalt not nag. It's just the most fruitless exercise, but it just, it's, it, and it's not just women, but, but women sometimes think, if I just nag him one more time, he's going to magically say, ah, oh, now I'm highly motivated to do that thing you wanted me to do. It just never works. And we, we tend to, it's death by paper cut. It's one little thing at a time. And you can get so absolutely free of it. Ladies, let me just tell you something. I'm going to put on my marriage counselor's hat for a moment. Um, to a certain extent, you just have to leave your man to God. God cares more about his sanctification than you do. And Peter, Peter the apostle actually said to wives, you can win him without saying a word. <laughs> That's revolutionary. And our culture today says, no, just don't be kind, don't be submissive, don't follow, don't encourage, don't honor. Don't honor that guy because he's not performing the way you want him to. If you'll use your words, you can shape him. No, you won't. You'll just discourage him. And then guys, by the way, we can do the same thing. Like, there's certain things that come out of a man's mouth that are thoughtless towards his wife sometimes because it's not that we're trying to be mean, it's that we're not proactively being thoughtful. And so we just speak to our wives and sometimes our children like, you know, it's some dude on the job when they deserve much more honor than that. Nagging, criticizing ultimately comes into that same container of we're judging one another. People aren't what we want them to be, so we're going to try to judge them, correct them, and fix them. And sometimes the Lord just says, how about you leave them to me? I've got more invested in them than you do. That's a $30 fee for all the marriage counseling tonight. You can (laughs) give it to Pastor Kent. All right. (laughs) Verse 12, and we're going to be done, okay? He just, Paul motivates us to live the life given to us by God. He says it again. So then, each of us will give an account of himself to God. That'll so free you up. We treat other people properly. When we recognize one, especially in the, in the context of Christianity... God has actually poured way more into them than we have. He's got way more invested in them than we do. He's actually more interested in them becoming who they should be than we will ever be. We typically want people to be who we think they should be for our benefit. And God is like, no, I actually want you to be who you're supposed to be because that's why I made you. You'll really enjoy it when you become who you're supposed to be. And we, we get our grubby little fingerprints all over people because we're trying to mold them and make them into our image. And so ultimately the Lord says, a better investment of your time and your energy and your words and your influence is to work on you. Just to work on your heart, work on your spirit, work on your behavior, work on your attitude. Work on your motivations. And you have to discipline yourself because this is what can happen. When you start being who you're supposed to be and doing what you're supposed to do, you'll, you'll be locked in for a minute and then you'll glance over here and you're like, they're not being who they're supposed to be. They're not doing, and God will be like, get back over here. And he'll just retrain you, keep looking ahead. And you'll be doing good for a minute and then you'll be like, man, they're not doing it. Let me, let me help them out. And the Lord's like, no, actually, no. How about no? How about you and me spend a couple of years where your primary I'm back. I was going to sing a little. Okay. 
It was such a good point too, and I lost it. Um, So your primary focus becomes just prepare. Start soberly thinking that you're going to give an account for you. Husbands and wives won't be teaming up at this assessment. It's just going to be you. And so for every moment that I'm frustrated with one of you guys or somebody in my family or somebody I work with or somebody somewhere out there, every moment that I'm fixated on how come they're not, and then you fill in the blank, those are moments that I could have gotten a much better return on my energy and my focus by saying, what's lacking in me? What could Jesus do more with this part of my life? if I learned how to happily surrender it and trust him. And guys, I know this may be foreign to some of you, but I'm telling you from the word as best as I can, but I'm also telling you as a guy who's had to wrestle through these things, I'm naturally selfish. Grew up with an orphan spirit. I got three minutes, hear me on this. Grew up with an orphan spirit because my dad left when I was real little. He came back, my mom left, never came back. By the age of eight or nine, I had to start taking care of myself. And then from age 14 to age 24, I was just like, I don't care what the Christians say. I don't care what God's word says. I grew up in the church. I heard all the stuff that kids hear. I was like, none of that matters to me. I'm going to take care of me because nobody else did. I didn't make that decision out loud, but it became part of my psychology. And then I got saved and I started realizing, oh my goodness, I'm nothing like Jesus. And I needed to plow through the word and have the word plow through me to turn up the soil of who I was so he could plant new seed in it. And so I'm telling you this stuff, not as an expert, but as a guy who, who, if I don't stay intentional about living this way, I'll just be that same old selfish kid that always thought he had to take care of himself at the expense of everybody else. That's not who you are. That's not who I am. Jesus has a better way for each of us. So I want you to stand. I'm going to pray for us. And I hope that you'll consider this tonight. I hope that you'll be motivated and not discouraged. The one thing I ask you not to do, don't tune out on this message. It's more important than most of us realize. Father, thank you. I just felt your relentless parenting of us tonight. Holy Spirit, I feel coached by you and equipped by you tonight. We all want to be better, Lord but we have stubborn patches in our lives and our behavioral patterns that we need the oil of the spirit on. Gummed up gears that won't turn in the right direction without the oil. So we welcome you, Holy Spirit. Bring the oil. Jesus, we want the oil of transformation before we experience the fire of evaluation. So we're yours again, fresh right now. Teach us how to live this out at home. Teach us how to live this out at work. Teach us how to live that out in the church. In your awesome name, we pray with thanksgiving. Amen.